Good evening. Uh, again, my name is Joseph Alukal. I'm a, uh, I'm a urologist and faculty here at NYU. Thanks for being here. I'm going to start us off by talking about problems with fertility in the man after treatment for cancer. And certainly uh, the majority of what I'll be speaking about has to do with urological cancers, but some of this is very applicable to any cancer. Um, as Rachel said, obviously any questions, please feel free to, to raise your hand and uh, we'll try and tackle them as we go. So let's start off with some, some definitions. Infertility, uh, in general, what we're talking about is the inability of a couple to conceive after one year despite properly timed unprotected intercourse. Male infertility is, is when you've got the above problem and that's in the context of an abnormality on a semen analysis. And this is a fairly common problem. It's probably more common, I think, than, than anyone realizes. It affects six million couples in the United States annually, and that's roughly one in six couples approximately. Of those, if you were to sort of try and break down, we've figured out what the causes are. How does, how does that map out for us? About a quarter of those couples, you're going to find an identifiable male factor alone. Another 20%, give or take, you're going to find both a male and a female factor. And so in total, that means 50% of these couples, the guy has a problem. The guy is bringing a problem to the table. What do I do when I see these people? Uh, I want to take a thorough history. Uh, it's very important that history includes information about the patient's partner. I want to do a thorough physical exam. And I'm going to do a semen analysis and some other blood work, and we're going to talk more about that. But, but basically, the blood work, I want you to assume that what I've done is I've checked some hormones, and that includes a testosterone. Let's talk a little bit more about semen analysis, because this is going to be able to help you understand what I'm talking about as I go on with this. So what are the things we're looking for in a semen analysis? Um, one of the examples I want you guys to come back to as I go on will be thinking about the patient who's had a vasectomy. Uh, oftentimes in my office, it's very difficult for patients to understand that somebody has a problem with sperm making but not with ejaculation of semen. And I ask them to think of a guy who's had a vasectomy who's still completely normal afterwards in terms of his sexual function, in terms of ejaculation. He still ejaculates semen. There just aren't any sperm in it. And so I use this to try and help people to understand that the two things are different, okay? So one of the most useful pieces of information I get when I look at a semen analysis is simply how much fluid is there. Um, if you're looking at a report, this is going to be reported as semen volume, okay? You move on from there and you're looking at how many sperm are there. What's, what's the number of sperm in the whole sample? Or what's the number of sperm in each milliliter of semen? And effectively, you're looking at the same things here. You're just asking the question, are there a lot of sperm? Are there few sperm? Are there no sperm? We're looking at the movement of sperm. Are they moving? What percentage of them are moving? We do uh, subdivide this in, in a number of different ways. We ask how the organization of the movement is. Are these sperm moving in a very organized or, or, or rapid fashion? Or are they simply sort of sluggishly swimming around? But you're going to see this listed on your report as uh, motility. Uh, literally the movement of the sperm. And finally, the appearance of the sperm. Are, are there two heads? Are there two tails? Gross abnormalities? Or are there subtle abnormalities? Are the shapes of the heads wrong? Are the tails broken? And we call this morphology. And so somebody who is taking care of patients with male infertility can look at a semen analysis and look at these particular parameters and be able to sort of figure out what, what the patient's overall status is with regard to sperm making, okay? We do take this, this definition of density, and, and you'll hear people use terms that describe different problems with density. If you have less than 20 million sperm in each cc of semen, that's called oligospermia. Uh, if you have less than 5 million sperm in each cc of semen, that's called severe oligospermia. And if there are rare or no sperm, we, we call this azospermia. And you might hear me use these terms as we go on. So let's take a step back and try and look at the big picture question. How, how might I categorize patients who come in who have this problem? And I ask patients to think about it in, in two different ways. And now that, that doesn't necessarily mean that a patient couldn't have both problems. And that's important. We'll, we'll go into that in more detail as we go on in the talk. But the first set of problems are guys who are blocked. Okay, And so you, you have some sort of process by which, although they make sperm, those sperm cannot make it out into their ejaculate, okay? Again, think of the guy who's had a vasectomy. This person, they ejaculate semen, there just aren't any sperm in the semen, and for that reason, they can't get somebody pregnant. 
Uh, there are any number of causes of this. There are different places in our uh, male anatomic tract where we can become obstructed. But I want you to think of this as sort of a mechanical process. It, it is literally that, that something is in there that can't get out. Whereas non-obstructive causes, now you're talking about failure of the testicle to make sperm. Okay, this is a different issue than the guy who makes them, but they can't get out. And there are any number of causes for this. There's all kinds of medical conditions that can cause it. There are hormonal problems that can cause it. There are genetic problems that can cause it. It's a very long list. And what we're going to talk about today are the ways that treating cancers in young men, men of any age for that matter, can cause some of these problems, both obstructive and non-obstructive. So let's take a second to review the anatomy of the male pelvis. Um, I, we're going to go back to this slide a number of different times in this talk. But again, I've already started talking about the idea of the testicle making sperm down here. Uh, this, this process is going on once we go into puberty uh, throughout uh, all of our adult lives, uh, in, in most of our cases. When sperm are finished being made, uh, they then move into the epididymis, which is a structure that lives right alongside of the testicle, where basically the sperm mature, they learn how to swim. And then they travel out of the epididymis uh, through uh, this long tube called the vas deferens. This is the tube that is clipped when a patient has a vasectomy. Again, that, that patient is making sperm still. They just don't make it into their ejaculate. The vas deferens travels all the way through our inguinal canal into our pelvis and meets up at our prostate with the seminal vesicle as well. And now the prostate and the seminal vesicle are, are two organs that basically only have one job, and that's to make the fluid that goes into semen. Okay? The, the composition of this fluid is particularly amenable to sperm swimming in it, living in it, uh, being able to survive in it based on what they can eat, uh, fructose or particular sugar that's in there. And so these three things together constitute all the parts you need to, to make a normal ejaculation to have a guy who's, who's going to be fertile. Fluid from the prostate, fluid from the seminal vesicle, and sperm coming from the vas deferens. Just to give you some other landmarks on this drawing here, uh, or just above the prostate here, we have the bladder. Uh, and uh, here, obviously, we have the penis. And, and within the penis, the urethra. And this is where the ejaculate is going to come out of. So let's shift, shift gears just a little bit and, and start talking about specifically our topic for the evening, cancer and male infertility. Again, like I said, much of my experience with this has to do with the urologic cancers uh, that can cause male infertility. Uh, we treat a significant number of these in our office, uh, obviously because of the fact that you're, you're dealing with structures on this diagram, like the bladder or the prostate or the testicle, that are centrally involved in this, you wouldn't be surprised that it causes problems with infertility. The cancers we're going to talk about tonight are, are prostate, testis, and bladder cancer, not necessarily in that order. Now, importantly, th these are cancers that are diagnosed in a urologist's office or treated in a urologist's office, but certainly other malignancies occurring to men can cause infertility. Uh, some of the common ones, uh, especially that, that affect adolescents or young men and thereby can really create problems with regard to fertility, leukemias, lymphomas, uh, sarcomas more rarely. Obviously, there are others. And in these cases, more often than not, the effects are due to the side effects of chemotherapy. And we'll, we'll talk about how we try and prevent this or ameliorate this. But when we ask the question, how are we going to be treating uh, infertility in the male patient, there is a little bit more that we need to have in terms of background information. So we, we really do sort of have two large groups of options, OK? And, and one relates to the other. The first are the assisted reproductive techniques. Uh, your, your definitions of this are going to vary. But this includes in vitro fertilization, IVF, which many people have heard of. Uh, Dr. Griffo will be talking about this in much more detail later. Uh, and artificial insemination, depending on whether or not the female partner has received drugs before this procedure. Uh, this is when a semen sample is provided, uh, it's processed, and then um, a sig the, what's left over is deposited directly into the woman's uterus uh, through the cervix in a procedure. This is to improve the odds of conception. Um, the other sort of big picture treatment that I want people to think about is cryopreservation of sperm. And this is what's commonly termed as sperm banking. Uh, so the, the patient goes to a cryo facility, provides an ejaculated sample of sperm, uh, and this is processed there and then frozen, and it can be used anytime in the future thereafter. Uh, again, the assisted reproductive techniques, you can divide this up uh, a little bit further. Uh, like I said, 
the, according to, to some uh, definitions, this will include artificial insemination. Uh, again, it includes in vitro fertilization. And then a specific type of in vitro, in vitro fertilization that we call ICSI, where you take a single digit numbers of sperm and you inject them into eggs, okay? And this is done uh, most typically in cases where guys have severe problems and they're only able to produce very rare numbers of sperm. Now you could theoretically do all three of these procedures with ejaculated sperm if the guy ejaculates enough sperm, but if you're looking at having to take sperm out of the testicle with the procedure, uh, you're going to have to do this last one, this, this ICSI procedure, and we'll have to keep that in mind. Cryopreservation, uh, this can be done regardless of whether or not the patient is actively trying to conceive. I think this is very important. A lot of times people forget about this as an option. Uh, if the patient is young and single and, and doesn't have any interest on their own at that time in terms of having children. Oftentimes I think the physician overlooks needing to discuss this with the patient. Uh, but certainly that patient can put away this sample for a rainy day. Uh, so it, it is still something to be thought of even if the patient is single uh, or if the patient's not actively trying to conceive. Depending on where you are in the United States, uh, the cost is, relatively speaking, minimal. Uh, in Manhattan, most places you're going to be paying about $500 up front in terms of a one-time processing fee and initial uh, uh, storage fee. And then every year thereafter, the, the facility gets in touch with the patient and asks them for another $500. Uh, in other places where I've practiced uh, around the United States, this cost has been even less. It's been two or $300 up front and a yearly fee of two or $300. Uh, apparently everything is more expensive in Manhattan. Um, now the thing that's important about this is it's ultimately still going to require one of these other procedures, okay? Uh, many times if the patient's completely fertile and they, they bank a significant amount of sperm, it's reasonable to anticipate that they're going to be able to use that with insemination. Uh, if the patient has some sort of problem in terms of sperm making and they bank only few numbers of sperm, uh, they might need to move forward with IVF or even with ICSI. So let's move back to these cancers, and I, I am going to start with the urological cancers that cause male infertility. Um, again, we're looking at prostate, testis, and bladder. Prostate cancer is, is certainly has is, is got to be the most common cancer we see in our office. It's the most common solid malignancy in men. Uh, there are 200,000 new cases diagnosed roughly every year in the United States. It's a difficult disease for, for men to figure out how they're going to choose to treat it because there's so much variability in terms of the way patients present, how old are they at the time of presentation, and how aggressive is their disease. But in addition, there are a myriad of treatment options, all of which work pretty well. So broadly speaking, we can think about these treatment options as including surgery, uh, radiation, uh, and medicines. Okay, so we're, we're talking about both chemotherapy but more commonly some hormonal treatments that we use to try and put these cancers into remission. Now all of these treatments can cause erectile dysfunction. That's a very common problem that we, we talk about in our office um, and, and certainly that can relate to sexual function and the patient's uh, potential in terms of fertility. Uh, and again, it's a common condition. It's thought to affect as many as 2 million men in the United States today. So that's, that's not how many men were diagnosed this past year, but how many men are trying to live with this disease right now. The reason I keep going back to the fact that it's a very common disease is that although it is typically thought to be a disease of men later on in life, there are more and more men who are diagnosed with this uh, earlier and earlier in their lives. Um, much of this has to do with PSA screening. A lot of this has to do with our awareness of the disease. But I'm certainly not surprised when I see somebody in my office who is 45 years old, he's just been diagnosed with prostate cancer, and he tells me, yeah, my wife and I have one kid, but we were certainly planning on having more. So when you think about this, think about it as a common disease that can affect men of almost any age. Uh, certainly once they're over uh, uh, 40, it, it's a very real possibility. How do we treat this? Again, uh, our treatment options, thinking of them broadly, surgery, radiation, and medicines. Let's start with surgery. Like I said before, uh, surgery causes mechanical problems or, or obstructive problems here, okay? And, and really, it's, it's kind of the ultimate of all obstructions. Patients after this procedure are not going to ejaculate, okay? So I think the next slide, exactly. Again, when we, we talked about this before in terms of what goes into semen, uh, the prostate is making fluid that goes into semen, the seminal vesicles are making fluid that goes into semen, and the vas deferens is bringing sperm into the semen. At the time of a prostatectomy, all three of these structures are affected. The prostate comes out, the seminal vesicles come out, 
and the vas deferens is clipped off. And so basically after this, the patient has sort of had the, the ultimate vasectomy. There's, there's no way to reverse this. And they're not going to ejaculate anymore. Patients are obviously very worried about this. They, they um, certainly the guys who are interested in still having children, uh, they're very concerned about this. But all patients are bothered about the idea that this is going to affect their sexual satisfaction. I do try and get them to understand that this should not affect their sensation of orgasm. It simply means that when they are sexually active and they have an orgasm, they're not going to ejaculate anything anymore. Uh, obviously, we've talked about this already, but surgery can cause problems in terms of erections. Um, and that's another way by which you can interfere with uh, a couple's sexual activity and theoretically interfere with fertility if it wasn't for the fact that you already had this much bigger whammy going on. Um, and so you have to ask the question, how are we going to treat this person? If the patient is sitting in front of you and they are 45 and they tell you, look, I, I fully intend on trying to have more children, and they haven't yet had their operation, I would tell them that their best option is to go and cryopreserve sperm before they get treated. Um, if they come to you after they've had their operation and they hadn't been educated regardless beforehand, uh, regarding this issue beforehand, and they tell you, look, I want to know what my options are for having a child now, there's really only one thing we can do, which is we can do a small procedure to take sperm out of the testicle. Again, we haven't interfered with, with the creation of sperm in the testicle or the epididymis, storage of sperm in the epididymis. We can take those sperm out, and then we can have the partner, uh, the patient's partner, get pregnant uh, again through this IVF uh, procedure known as ICSI, where we've got rare sperm and, and they can be used to fertilize eggs. Radiation. So there are other malignancies, obviously, where radiation is used to uh, treat the cancer, and we're going to talk about that um, in detail. But in this particular case, we're talking about even different kinds of radiation that are administered uh, to the prostate. Uh, external beam radiation, where the patient comes in for regular treatments and the prostate's radiated with a machine that's outside their body. Brachytherapy, where the patient has radioactive seeds implanted inside of the prostate. Uh, and there are new treatments such as a uh, cyber knife, which is focused radiation administered by a, uh, a robot, which allows for a, a very focused delivery of radiation only to the prostate. Um, this is different from surgery. There's a big difference in that patients after radiation do ejaculate. Uh, they will oftentimes tell you that there is less ejaculate that comes out. Um, and certainly, we tell people, even if there's been a shield put over the testicles to try and protect them, that they should still wait two years after radiation to attempt conception. And we assume that this is due, or we think we, we tell people to do this because we assume that there is damage to the DNA of the sperm uh, as, as they're exposed to radiation during this treatment. Certainly, uh, in these people, sperm banking is a very valid option to tell them to think about it if they tell you that they're interested in, uh, in future fertility. The medicines, uh, I, I've left chemotherapy out of this because I, I do think we're going to be talking more about chemotherapy and how we avoid its effects on people. But broadly uh, thinking about these medicines, they're designed in different ways to shut off a patient's hormones. So they shut off the effect of their testosterone within the body. This can interfere both with uh, proper sperm making and with erections. Now, that is not always the case. You do occasionally see patients who are on these hormonal medications and will have a normal semen analysis or have normal sexual function in terms of erections or have both. Uh, but certainly, if I saw a patient who was going to start hormonal treatment and they told me that they were interested in uh, having children in the future, I would again recommend to them that they consider sperm banking. We do tend to think of these hormonal treatments as something that is used only in the, the event that the patient is, uh, is older and has metastatic disease, the man in his 80s who has a very high PSA and has prostate cancer that's spread throughout his body. But the youngest person I could think of in my office who was on hormonal treatments was 41. And so certainly when young people come in with aggressive prostate cancer, we oftentimes have to use this particular treatment modality in combination with others, be it surgery or radiation or both. And certainly you want to be able to tell the patient, look, I know that you're going to start these hormones before you move on to your other treatments, um, and you think it's just a, a shot or a pill that you're taking, but it's going to interfere with these processes. And if you're interested in having more children, I think we should look at this right now. We should look at sperm banking now. Bladder cancer, I lumped this one in with prostate cancer for a, a good reason. And it's that the surgeries, relatively speaking, have a lot of overlap. Uh, bladder cancer is less common, thankfully, than prostate cancer. There are only 65,000 new cases a year in the United States. Of those, 50,000 occur in men. 
Uh, this has to do, or it's had to do historically with uh, the, pre, uh, the greater number of men who are smokers uh, in this country than women, although women have unfortunately been catching up to men in this regard. Uh, of these new, uh, newly presenting cases, uh, roughly speaking, only 15 to 20 percent of them require removal of the bladder. Okay, so the majority of these can be treated with endoscopic procedures where we take the tumor out from inside the bladder but leave the bladder behind. That obviously doesn't cause any real problems with regard to fertility. But if you take the whole bladder out, and we're back to our diagram, pretty typically it, it's almost an impossibility to leave any of these other structures behind. And for cancer control purposes, uh, we've very standardly taken out in men the bladder, the prostate, the seminal vesicles, and clipped the vas deferens again. So you end up with the same kind of mechanical problems that you have after a prostatectomy. Uh, again, we're doing, roughly speaking, 10 or 12,000 cystectomies every year in the United States. This is the procedure where the bladder and the prostate come out and you have these problems. Of those, the majority of them are in men. And so these men, if they are interested in, in having any sort of uh, future, future fertility pr potential, the same rules apply. Either they have to bank sperm before their surgery or they have to plan on having a procedure to remove sperm from the testicle uh, sometime in the future to be used with IVF. Testis cancer is maybe our most important malignancy with regard to fertility preservation, and I'll explain why. This is in spite of the fact that it is, relatively speaking, fairly uncommon. Uh, testis cancer, there's a tremendous amount of awareness about it in the United States, uh, thanks largely in part to Lance Armstrong. Uh, but relatively speaking, it's a rare cancer, thankfully. There's only 8,000 new cases of this diagnosed uh, every year. Again, this is in comparison to 200,000 new cases of prostate cancer a year. Uh, testis cancer is a complicated disease to treat. Uh, there are, it, it is sort of the, the textbook example of multimodality treatment of cancer. We use combinations of surgery, radiation, or medicine based on the type of cancer and the stage at which the patient presents. Now the good news is we do a very good job of treating this cancer. The overwhelming majority of patients, 90 plus patients, are likely to survive this diagnosis and do absolutely fine. Uh, but it is with us having to use some combination of these treatments. It causes more fertility issues, and it's sort of more in the forefront of the mind of the urologist taking care of this disease with regard to fertility preservation because of the age range. You're typically seeing men present with this disease between the ages of 18 and 35. And so oftentimes, it is on their mind, the patient's mind, hey, are we going to be doing something to preserve my fertility? Are we going to be doing something to preserve my sexual function in the future? The other thing that's important about this disease uh, from an understanding standpoint with regard to the physiology is that the condition itself is associated with infertility. There's very good data from all over the world, but particularly from Denmark, that tells us people who get this condition, they were infertile to some degree in the first place. Now, we don't know why. There's, there's a lot of theories as to why these two conditions overlap. Uh, but the punchline is you're already somewhat behind the eight ball when you see a patient with testis cancer and you're asking the question, how am I going to preserve his fertility in the future? The problems we have as a result of treating testis cancer are certainly more complicated than either with prostate cancer or with bladder cancer. So one of the mechanical problems we can create, patients can have problems with ejaculation. So if the patient has a spread of their disease into the lymph nodes in, uh, in their pelvis or in their abdomen, the surgery we do to take that out can oftentimes make it such that they can no longer ejaculate. Hormonal problems, once you take out one testicle, you can create problems with the patient making enough testosterone to support sperm making uh, to an adequate degree. And finally, there's this question of this intrinsic problem that the patient comes to you with in the first place where they may not make great sperm to begin with. Uh, and oftentimes, you're actually wrestling with a combination thereof. Surgery, like I said, the, the first surgery you're going to be doing, the only way this, this condition gets diagnosed is a surgery where the testicle within which there's a mass is removed. So obviously, at that point, you've, you've reduced the patient's capacity to make sperm and testosterone by 50%. Uh, beyond that, many people are then going on to have this second surgery where we're going to be taking out lymph nodes from the pelvis and the abdomen, and that's going to interfere with ejaculation. So the result is that patients are not only ejaculating less, but they are ejaculating less with fewer sperm in that ejaculate. And this can make natural conception very difficult. So if, if you see the 24-year-old guy with this condition, and he, he gets treated with the surgery to remove one testicle, and then he gets his lymph node dissection surgery, and five years later he's now married and he's trying to start a family, that guy will oftentimes give a semen analysis that is really very poor. 
uh, there's, there's again a low volume of semen and within it there's a low number of sperm. And so if he anticipated that he might be able to conceive naturally with his new partner, that may not be an option. Certainly it depends upon his partner's age and her fertility status, maybe more so more importantly than anything else. But it, it's very important to tell patients who are single beforehand, before they're treated for this condition, look, this could adversely affect the chance you ever have of initiating a natural conception. Um, again, here's that diagram. Now we're talking about taking out the testicle on one side along with the associated structures from here. And then later, if we have to go in and take out these lymph nodes, we're talking about removing them from the pelvis and further up in the abdomen. And that the result of that is a, an interference with the body's nervous programming regarding ejaculation. Radiation. So again, everybody's going to get this first surgery where we make this diagnosis by taking out one testicle. Depending on the type of cancer, some people are going to get radiation treatment thereafter. That can injure the remaining testicle. Again, it's very important to tell these people, look, if you were thinking about trying to, to start having a family this year or, or to have another child this year, you're going to have to wait two years after you complete your radiation before we tell you that it's safe for you to try natural conception again. Um, this is an important detail. Some, some couples will choose to bank sperm before they start radiation and will move on with assisted reproductive techniques during the period of time that, that the patient's recovering from their radiation. Finally, the chemotherapies that we use here are not like the hormonal treatments that we use for prostate cancer. Uh, these are designed to kill cells within the testicle, and so it is very likely that they're going to injure the remaining testicle. Again, before people start chemotherapy, I'm, I'm adamant that they have a discussion regarding sperm banking. Uh, here we are. It, it is the most important option with this cancer, I think. It always allows people more options later. If they come back to you three, four, five, six years later, they've now started a family and you check a semen analysis and it's very poor or it shows nothing, you're so much happier if the patient was told to bank sperm before surgery and actually kept up with their fees and, and knows where their bank is. Uh, male patients, guys have a tendency to forget this kind of stuff, so it's important to encourage them to be proactive about these kinds of things. I think a very important question that, that maybe we need to be turning towards asking in places like our Cancer Institute, our Cancer Center, why isn't this always automatically done? Um, there's very good data that was done uh, surveying physicians that comes from uh, Chicago at Northwestern, and they asked the question, well, if you're a physician out there taking care of people with cancer, be it an oncologist or a urologist, why aren't you telling everybody to do this when you see a male patient? Um, the majority of physicians responded that they were concerned about cost or time, that they didn't think the patient would have time before they started their treatment to go do this, or that they thought it was too costly. We asked people to estimate what the cost was, and, and you got numbers back as high as tens of thousands of dollars when it's only a few hundred dollars, and so many patients are willing to do it. Uh, there is also difficulty overcoming the patient perception that it's unimportant relative to their cancer. So a 24-year-old guy sitting in front of you who's just been diagnosed with cancer may very well tell you, Doc, I could care less about having kids in the future. I just want to survive this disease right now. And so I think it's, it's incumbent upon us to tell patients, look, you're very likely to survive this disease, and what we want to do is mitigate the problems you're going to have relating to that survival, to that treatment in the future. Now, again, we, we talked about the idea that this doesn't just apply to the cancers uh, that a urologist sees and treats. It applies to any cancer where the patient is in, interested in having children after they've been treated. But certainly, sort of most importantly, uh, the, the cancers that affect adolescents and young adults, again, we're talking about certain types of leukemia, certain types of lymphoma, and uh, more rarely, thankfully, sarcomas. Um, you know, when this happens to an adolescent or a young adult, you, you have some difficult issues. The young adult, this person may not be currently in a relationship. They may not actively be thinking about having kids. The adolescent, that person is there with their parents, uh, for whom there may be a tremendous amount of, of uh, awkwardness discussing the idea of going to a sperm bank and providing a sperm sample. Uh, but certainly the, the, the most difficult conversation I think happens when the patients in question are children. And the, the parents have a difficult time, rightfully so, visualizing this child as an adult and, and being concerned about this. And certainly the parent is much more concerned, uh, again rightfully so, about simply having their child survive this disease. Uh, but I do think it's important to have this discussion with families regardless of the age of the patient because it can be something where you see that patient many years later and, and they wish that someone had talked to them about this sooner. Uh, sperm banking is, is again centrally important. It's an option uh, for, um, for adolescents. 
but some ethical issues arise. Uh, adolescents aren't able to consent for themselves. Some parents are concerned about having a patient go and have to masturbate to provide this sample uh, for the sperm bank. And certainly for pre-adolescents who are not sexually mature, um, th this is an even more difficult question. There are people who have asked whether or not we can do uh, testicular tissue biopsies in these people and, and freeze that tissue to be used at a later date. Uh, that work is obviously still ongoing. It's, it's not clear that we know that that will work. So when you think about the idea of sort of helping preserve fertility in these patients, I think it's very important to uh, help the patient and their family understand what's the chance that, that the, the patient is going to survive this disease. If it's very good, you can help them to recognize that if fertility has any chance of being a future issue, it's very easy to help preserve their fertility simply by having them go and bank sperm. It doesn't cost a tremendous amount of money. It's not a labor-intensive process, and it's not going to interfere with them getting treated promptly and in a fashion where they have a chance of curing their disease. I do think it's helpful to, to try and educate them regarding their future options in terms of assisted reproduction. It's an alphabet soup for many people. It's very difficult for them to understand. Have this conversation with the patient and their family, uh, with their spouse, with their parents, depending on their age. Uh, and help them to understand all of these issues to a greater degree so they can make an informed decision. It's a very difficult time for people when they're confronted with a new diagnosis of cancer. Understanding allows them to make a, a truly informed decision. Uh, I really do think the most important things you can do before treatment, really pay attention to the patient, examine them well. Um, if the patient is with a spouse, find out how fertile that spouse is because that's a vitally important question. Dr. Griffo is going to talk about that more. But certainly if, if the, the patient's partner is, is known to be infertile, uh, something like sperm banking is important because it affords them future options, but you might have to recognize that they're going to need to do something like in vitro fertilization in the future regardless, so maybe you let it be and plan on doing a sperm extraction in the future. Uh, if they have time, check their hormones and their semen analysis before. Uh, all of the things above that on this list should be covered by the patient's insurance, so they don't have to worry about cost. Uh, the, the things beneath that, you know, when you're talking about sperm banking or assisted reproduction, uh, sperm banking is almost never covered by insurance, unfortunately, and I think that's something that ought to change. Uh, assisted reproduction is covered to varying degrees by different insurance plans, and helping patients understand that will hopefully help them be less afraid about the potential future costs. Uh, so, uh, in conclusion, the evaluation of the male patient with cancer with regard to fertility, this is quickly and easily done. It doesn't interfere with prompt treatment. It will help the patient make an educated decision regarding their treatment course, and it will offer them more fertility options in the future. Uh, again, uh, I think empowering these people to make an informed decision is vitally important, uh, and it helps the patient live their life without the side effects of having their cancer treated, uh, with regard to fertility at least, and that obviously speaks to the concept of survivorship, of helping people survive their malignancy without long-lasting scars. Uh, and so certainly I think a, a, step, a vital step forward that, that we need to take. Uh, at NYU Urology, we're obviously here to help. So if uh, this is an issue for anybody in the audience or if you know somebody who needs to talk to someone about this, uh, feel free to, uh, to reach out to us. I'll, I'll leave the contact information up there while we take questions. Thank you.